John Blickman joins me this week to discuss the business aspects of starting a small brewery. This is Beersmith Podcast number 199. This is Beersmith Podcast number 199, and it's mid-September 2019. John Blickman joins me to talk about the business side of starting a small brewery. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Commander. The Brew Commander is a new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is an innovative, high-quality brew house controller with ultra-high precision and the ultimate in flexibility. Whether integrated or freestanding, the Brew Commander offers automated step mashing, boil timers, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. Order yours today from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. And finally, Beersmith 3 is available now for download and also the mobile versions out. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider recipe support to the Beersmith platform, along with new integrated water profile and mash pH tools for beer brewing. Dozens of new features, including cloud folders, updated databases, support for fruit juice and honey, as well as new Whirlpool hop options. Download your free 21-day trial today from beersmith.com and give it a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome John Blickman. John is the president of Blickman Engineering and a longtime home brewer. Uh, John, it's, uh, it's great to have you back on the show, my friend. Great to be here. How you been, Brad? I am well. Uh, how about you? What's going on at Blickman Engineering these days? Oh, just always dreaming up more ideas than we have time to develop. And uh, <laughs> so working on some good commercial stuff, some uh, fun homebrew stuff coming out, some new features and some new products. So I know you had some new stuff at uh, Homebrew Con. What, uh, what, can you mention just a couple of them here before we get started? Yeah, the big one was our Brew Commander uh, temperature controller. Uh, it's both... Uh, gas, propane, and uh, electric. And uh, it's got a really cool touchscreen interface, really homebrew or brewing focused uh, controls. So it's, it uh, has just lots of neat features that you just don't get with a PID based system. So uh, go to our webpage, check it out. It's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. And the price point is great. Uh, we we're able to uh, um, source a lot of it here in the States and uh, get the price uh, down quite a bit from our previous product, and and it has a lot more features. And it's a microcontroller based than one, I think, right? With a touchscreen. Yes, it is. Yeah, microcontroller nice. based. Uh, we use a uh, really high precision uh, uh, thermistor thermometer uh, for it, and uh, um, it's got a real easy to connect to your kettle and um, adaptable. You can add uh, you know bolt the modules together, and you know add on them. To them in the future. It's got a neat little touchscreen button to turn your pump on and off, and uh, it'll do uh, uh, recipe automation, um, you know, for mash and for boil and all sorts of really cool stuff. Nice. Looking forward to seeing that. Um, now, in addition to the homebrew, though, you you do a lot of professional brewing equipment. I understand. That is true. We've been we've actually been selling our one barrel system since. Uh, 2007 or eight, when we came out with our boiler maker, uh, and we've got hundreds, if not a thousand, of those things out there, uh, individual kettles, uh, uh, operating in breweries uh, that um, you know people have, have just started these uh, breweries and and small areas tap rooms, or just even to just kind of get you know established. Do they like? Uh, commercial brewing is our market for it. And then it becomes a great pilot system for it. Uh, and then the past few years, we've really uh, ramped up and sell uh, systems up to about seven barrel. Um, and we really tailored some of these systems uh, specifically towards that market. We didn't just scale down a big uh, skidded commercial system. Uh, we've kind of made a cross between those, um, the between homebrew and 
um, the, the skidded commercial systems and uh, we call it our hybrid system and they're very economical and just super easy to use, super easy to install. So uh, you have uh, one, three, five, seven roughly barrel systems? We, we added a two barrel. So we have a one, a two, a three and a half, a five, and a seven are our uh, workhorse systems. And uh, then, of course, we've got uh, fermenters and bright tanks and pumps and chillers and glycol chillers and all that kind of stuff uh, to go with it. Hose, everything from fittings and hoses to complete brew houses. So, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, we've been around for a long time and we're help, just happy to share our experience with people. And uh, that's uh, some of what we're going to do today. Now, I think, you, yeah, you also did a webinar recently on Going Pro and uh, talked quite a bit about the business aspect of Going Pro, um, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, how, how many breweries do you think you've helped uh, get started here? Oh, geez. Uh, I, I would put a guess at somewhere between three and 500. I mean, just a lot of... Uh, a lot of breweries and a lot, you know, a lot that became pilot systems in, in bigger breweries. So quite a few. Nice. Well, let's, let's talk through some of the uh, big decisions you have to make if you're starting a brewery and uh, perhaps the first one uh, and one of the most fundamental ones is, uh, you know, you're going to start with just a tap room or are you going to go into a production brewery where, uh, you know, where the margins are a little bit lower, right? Uh, the margins can be a lot lower, the, the gross margins, you know, because you're selling, um, you know, you get like roughly 100 uh, pints out of a, um, a keg. Yeah, you know, U- U.S. Barrel. keg of beer, which is what, 31 gallons, I think? Uh, well, Pretty no, much. like a half barrel. So what's that, 15 and three quarters, 15 and 15 a half? and three quarters, yeah. Yeah. Gallons, which is, I, I don't right. know how many liters. I'll figure it out in a minute. Right. So wholesale, you're going to sell that. Um, that uh, keg of beer for 150 to 180, depending on what it is and, and that kind of thing. And of course, that's going to depend where you're at in the country and whatnot. Um, you know, but if you're selling them for five or six dollars a pint, then you're getting, you know, 500 or 600 dollars a revenue out of that same uh, uh, keg of beer. Now, that said, there are some other expenses that go with it that, you know, like ha- you know, having a retail presence and all that, that you wouldn't have um, if you were just a production brewery. So with production brewery, you've got to have, um, you know, to make the same amount of money, you would just uh, need to make more beer. Uh, uh, but then you've got distribution and distribution costs and things like that. So, you know, there's trade-offs uh, both ways. Um, but the key thing is to understand there, you've got to kind of go in knowing you know, I'm really interested in the direct to consumer retail sale uh, type model, and you may or may not, um, you know, sell some uh, cakes wholesale to some local restaurants or, or or breweries, which is it's great advertising for you know to get people to uh, you know be able to try your beer where they may not have uh, come into your your place, you know, made a special trip there. So it's great advertising. Um, and then the other uh, thing is to have a, uh, you know, a bigger production brewery uh, with uh, like a tasting room uh, kind of model. And that's obviously pretty common. Um, but a lot of that has but to a, do but with- But a production markets. brewery, you're, you're also selling uh, through wholesale, through restaurants, through other right. sources, right? Right. Your predominant cash flow is coming from uh, wholesale accounts. Right. And the, the margins on those are probably less than half, right? Oh yeah, less than half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to go back, I, I did the numbers here real quick. Uh, half barrel is uh, fifteen point five gallons. We're talking about half half barrel kegs yeah. are typically what's sold yeah. in the U.S., which is fifty eight point six liters. So for those of you, those of you overseas, uh, we're talking about fifty eight liters roughly, and and a barrel uh, U.S. barrel is roughly a little over a hundred liters, right? So uh, yeah, mm-hmm. so those are the kinds of numbers we're talking about here. Um, well, a lot of breweries start out small, uh, you know, selling right out of the tap room, but then they eventually mm-hmm. go through an expansion uh, and 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 move into uh, uh, commercial sales where the profit margin uh, drops substantially. So, so, I mean, growth's a problem in the industry as well because uh, it's hard to grow into smaller and smaller margins, right? Um, it can be, yes. And, you know, a lot of that is you've got to understand the market that you're in. If you're in a, a smaller community, 
Um, and uh, there's another bigger production brewery, uh, for example, is going to be harder for you to sell uh, the beer to all those different accounts as well. Um, and, and just trying to, you know, just in today's market, uh, you know, it's just, it's really important to know what your individual niche is. Yeah. And we were talking about this before the show, but the craft market's getting more and more crowded now. Um, so mm-hmm. it is harder and harder to get into, you know, grocery stores, tap, uh, restaurants and so on. Right. Yeah, it is. You know, and that's the, the one benefit of, um, having your own tap room is, you get to choose what's on there. You don't have to battle with uh, somebody else. And a lot of that battle happens not only with, oh, you'll just sell more of my beer because it's so awesome, uh, but, hey, I'll cut you a great deal on it that the other guy won't cut you, and it's great beer. So, And that's just that's how competition and capitalism works. Yeah. So, so, mm-hmm. I, so I think most people, uh, uh, because of the size and the money and the marketing and everything required to go into a production brewery model, most most breweries start out uh, more with a tap room model. Would that be accurate? I think. You know, that's what uh, that's what we're really seeing is a lot of them starting more uh, more of them starting smaller and growing than uh, what we were seeing five years ago. You know, even even two years ago, where it's. Hell, I've never. This is my first brewery, and I'm I'm going to start with a thirty barrel brew house. Um, wow, that that was pretty common. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, well, another fundamental decision you have to pick is uh, obviously a location. Uh, how important is a location, and how do you go about picking one? Well, that is a great question, and you know, there's there's so many of these topics that we're going to talk about today that have nothing to do with making you know brewing beer and recipes and all that. Um, and but it's a massive part of the business and, and really determines whether it's going to be successful or not. Um, so as far as location, if you're just a production brewery and you're going to have a little tap room just, you know, to get some local interest, uh, it's probably a lot more economic to move out into an industrial area where uh, where properties are less expensive. You know, so you can spend less per month on on the rent. Uh, and then people will make that destination destination trip, you know, to come out and visit visit the tap room. Um, but recognize the predominant amount of your revenues uh, and and profits coming from the production brew house. So you know you're not going to be maximizing your your tap room sales if you're out in one of those areas most likely. Uh, so then on the other end of the extreme is if you're going to be a tap room. Uh, you really need to go where the customers are and where the customers want to go. Very, you know, I, I encourage people to think not as a brewery or where can I get a better deal, but where do I need to go where my customers want to go? Uh, sometimes they like to go out into, you know, a country setting and get away. Um, if that's if that's where, uh, you know, you see your niche. A lot of times it's, hey, I want to go down to the cool downtown strip where, you know, lots going on and just bounce around between, you know, a couple bars and a, and a tap room or two and, and that. So it's really doing that research and, and determining what you want your niche to be, but really f- figuring out where, where's your customer going to want to go. Yeah. I always think real estate, uh, the three rules of real estate are location, location, location. So, it, I mean, it does make a huge difference if you're in the right location, you're running a retail business really. Right. You know, and that's not that you don't want to be mindful of costs, uh, but, you know, you're, you've got to look at it not as, oh, that's that property is three times as expensive as the one down on the county road. Uh, you got to look at it as I'll probably sell four times as much, five times as much beer on at this property than I will at the other one. So in my business plan and business model, it makes sense. And of course, uh, next, let's talk about the realities of running a tap room, uh, which means you have to have employees, you've got to have potentially a manager, uh, you've got to have, you know, facilities set up uh, mm-hmm. that look, you know, that's attractive and, and bring, draws people in, uh, has atmosphere and all that. What, uh, what are some of the considerations that come into play there? Well, one of the big considerations in, in what I like to suggest to people when you're going to, uh, you know, thinking in that planning stage of, of brewing is what are all the weekly tasks that need to be done? Um, there's obviously brewing beer, um, but there's also 
doing all the cellaring tests, kegging, uh, you know, you know, all the fermentation measurements that you need to do, uh, yeast uh, management, all those kind of things. So that, you know, as homebrewers, we pretty much know we've got to do those things and roughly how long that's going to take. But the other thing is now you've got to do bookkeeping and are you going to do that yourself and uh, or are you going to hire somebody to do that? Um, uh, ordering your supplies and uh, advertising, you know, how am I going to advertise? Who's going to do the advertising on Facebook? Am I going to do that or am I going to have somebody do that? Um, am I going to be open uh, seven days a week? Am I going to be open uh, just, uh, you know, Thursday through Sunday? Uh, am I going to be open Saturday during the day, Sunday during, you know, things like that you have to be thinking about. How am I going to cover all that? And, uh, you know, so you have to start thinking about, okay, well, maybe starting out, I'll do all the brewing and cellar work. And, but I'm going to have somebody help with uh, the, um, uh, the tap room. So I'm going to hire somebody to work in the tap room uh, uh, during the week and maybe I'll pitch out in there and on the weekend. So that's when you have to start thinking about how am I going to get all this stuff done? And I also encourage you to have a plan. If you do end up with explosive growth, which that's kind of the plan that you know what you're going to do. So, uh, you know, to respond to that, um, cause the worst thing to happen is to always be out of beer. Um, and, and a little side note there, uh, no shame in guest taps. Uh, that's an easy way to, uh, always have something to sell. So, uh, just, you know, bear that in mind too. Yeah, of course, um, a lot, a lot of people also aren't used to all the things that come with the accounting, the, uh, you know, doing payroll, all those other things that come into play, right? Maybe oh, even yeah. just managing people, you got to find people, you got to hire them, you got to, in some cases, fire them, right? Absolutely. It's, it's something that, um, you know, as a business owner myself and, and Brad as well, you learn, uh, and particularly in today's environment, it's extremely difficult to find people uh, that, you know, are going to be reliable, honest, all that, the, you know, with the unemployment rate uh, so low, uh, it, it can be difficult. Um, fortunately in the home brewing and, uh, and then up, you know, because I guess because of the home brewing, uh, 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 market and, and the whole hobby, um, you can get a lot of those people that are just going to be great honest people that would love to have part-time jobs doing work in, in your breweries. Um, so, um, that's, that's a great resource that we have in this industry, uh, that a lot of other industries don't, don't enjoy, but you know, just that, you know, the management of people don't underestimate how much effort and time, uh, that can, uh, can consume both training. Um, uh, I won't say, uh, how will I say encouraging them to continue growing and, uh, you know, uh, working at your own culture in your company. Um, that's, that's something that, uh, we hold very dear is, uh, and it's our primary uh, thing we use to hire people is making sure they fit in our culture. And, um, uh, it, you know, so that you just have a, a great, successful, harmonious uh, office environment. So um, those are just some of the things you've got payroll, payroll taxes, um, uh, different reports you'll have to file for uh, running retail. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, usually they'll start you off on monthly um, where you have to file taxes. And then, um, and of course you've got the extra set of taxes, you know, that'd be sales tax. Um, and, uh, with, uh, uh alcohol production, you're going to have, um, the, uh, the taxes associated with, uh, beer production. So, um, that's going to be a lot of record keeping and, um, and, uh, you know, documents you have to file and payments you have to make. None yeah, of it's I, 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 yeah. I, just for reference, I run a one person business and I pay 12 different kinds of taxes and most of them are monthly. So yeah. it gives you some idea of how much fun it is to run a business. It's, it, it is quite impressive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, we haven't talked about it, but, uh, you know, it gets even worse if you want to actually add food right now you're running a restaurant, right? Yeah, you know, and it's 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 kind of a that's a really mixed uh, bag. So you know, if you're going to serve food, you're going to have the health department that's going to come and uh, you know peek around your place uh, unannounced and and things like that. Uh, but I, 
I still think being home brewers, you're, we're just so used to sanitation and keeping things not gross. Uh, so I, I think that is something that comes a little bit more uh, natural to home brewers that are going to go pro. Um, but you still have to, you know, follow all the rules and regulations. And I, I think most uh, communities are pretty darn helpful in trying to help you understand. Um, what they don't like is when you say, that's dumb, I'm not doing it. They, they don't have much of a sense of humor yeah. for that. But, Nor does um, the TTB. but I mean, restaurants are a challenge in themselves. You know, very low margins typically on food. And um, yeah, you got to put together menus. You got to keep supplies. You got to throw out a lot of food. Real challenge, right? It, it, it very well can be. And I think, uh, you know, having in your niche and trying to figure out what, you know, who you are as a business and what you're going to do uh, uh, differently. And is, um, you know, there's you can do everything from the, the big benefit about having food is, you don't have people coming in for a pint, maybe, you know, and then just, hey, let's go uh, over to, you know, so-and-so and get a pizza or go out for dinner, and then they're leaving. Um, you know, you'll have them spend an evening there where they may, you know, have two or maybe three pints of beer, and, you know, and that brings that revenue up. Um, so the trick is, how do you get that food? And I've seen things from uh, people making arrangements with nearby restaurants and having menus on the table and they can just call there and the restaurants will deliver it right to the bar. Now, as a bar owner, you generally don't make much of anything on that, uh, but you do keep them at your establishment longer. Um, then there's the food truck route, which, you know, again, you're not necessarily going to be making profit on it other than having them stay longer at your place. Um, then I've also seen places that um, will uh, do some special uh, menu items, like it might be they may do pizzas. Um, there's a place uh, in a small community where, near where I grew up, and they they do uh, you know some kind of gourmet uh, pretzels that they make, and that's extremely low cost and and quite high margin. Um, I think they said they sold is either I can't remember they either sold. Uh, like ten thousand or thirty thousand dollars worth of pretzels in, uh, in their opening month, you know, some insane amount. So, uh, you know, some of that is just kind of, you know, do you necessarily need a, you know, are you going to be a, a, you know, a, a, a brew pub grill or type of thing, or are you just going to have some things to keep people there uh, for longer periods? So. Um, you know, but either way, anytime you're going to serve food, you're going to have to pay attention to, you know, the health requirements and different things like that. Uh, but don't let that intimidate you. It's just, you know, it's a lot of these rules and specifications and all uh, that stuff. And, you know, it's just somebody can sit down with you and, and help you with that. Most I found most inspectors with anything. Uh, if you're just not, you know, if if you have the attitude. I want to play by the rules. I just need to know the rules. They're more than happy to help. Uh, you know, I've experienced that with electrical inspectors to, uh, uh, you know, even even the, you know, we had the state IRS come in and, um, you know, just for an audit, you know, normal crap and, and just kind to them. They, you know, go about their business and, and uh, everything's good. So. Mm -hmm. Um, well, related to that, uh, you know, startup in particular, when you set up your location or whatever, now you've got um, a variety of renovations and building to do. Uh, and from what I've heard, most of the uh, people I've talked to that are going pro say, you know, they, they that's where they overrun usually, not on equipment, not on, but, you know, just the renovations that need to be done a lot of times to comply with mm -hmm. local code. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're 100 percent right. It's, you know, the equipment costs are pretty, you know, pretty basic things to, to you know, forecast and figure out this is what it's going to cost. And, um, you know, with the installation, um, you can generally uh, get, you know, contractors of, you know, just to move stuff. You know, you, so the, those costs are pretty, you know, you're not going to get many overruns on that. Um I think where a lot of people run into overruns is they didn't know what they needed uh, before they even started looking for properties. For example, floor loading, where people might get into a building, yeah, this would be great, and not, and then realize they can't put the equipment on that floor because it's not capable of bearing that much weight. Then you've got to put infrastructure underneath, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, knowing where you're going to put. Uh, your equipment and can, you know, so, I, you know, you can, when you're talking to your, uh, you know, commercial broker, for example, you say, I've got to have this and I've got to have this and I got to have that. Another one is 
electrical power. A lot of these uh, breweries uh, run on, um, uh, brew houses run on electric power. And uh, uh, that's a great way to go. That's the predominant type systems that we sell. Um, but you've got you've to be in a building that has that kind of power uh, that you need. And uh, most of the equipment manufacturers can tell you, okay, you're, you want a five barrel brew house, it's gonna be about this much power. And some of the other things is, okay, well, is, you know, just kind of knowing, do I have three phase power available or is it single phase? And, and uh, you know, how much, you know, how much do I have available in that building? Well, they need to run it over. Uh, you know, again, your broker, you know, the, the real estate broker ought to be able to help with that. Um, you know, and then there's things that aren't even related to brewing. It's, uh, is it zoned for what it is that I want it to do? Or am I going to have to get it rezoned? And that means going to the, uh, you know, the county or the city uh, zoning boards and, and petitioning for that. So make sure you know how it's zoned for use. Um, Things like uh, bathrooms, then, I know, and, and all this other stuff right. starts to come up, right? Right. So, you know, and knowing, you know, knowing, okay, what do I need for, uh, that's a great one. How many bathrooms do I need? How much, how many parking spots do I need is another one, um, you know, that, you know, we, um, we had to, uh, on our building, uh, we had to have, just because of the square footage, uh, we had to have about twice as many parking spots as what we needed. Um, but we kind of knew that going in and, uh, you know, had some, you know, uh, a place that we just use for storing material <laughs> that happens to have yeah. parking lot lines on a fr- it. A friend of mine ran into energy, energy thing. He had to have like a double door into the place and he had to go install a second vestibule, I guess, for, for energy efficiency, I guess. There's all, yeah, all, all know, these, all these local code things kind of kick in. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, you know, handicap access. Uh, that was another uh, thing. We had a door, for example. I mean, some of this, you know, that it can kind of spring on you um, is we had a door that was a ground level with parking right next to it. Uh, but we had to but it you had to go through the warehouse to get to the office and uh, they deemed that as unacceptable. So we had to build a, a handicap ramp on the front of our uh, building uh, at the cost of a lot. Um, to uh, uh, just to meet ADA compliance uh, for that. Um, you know, so there's some of those things, you know, don't assume. And, you know, before you start with a lease on that, um, it would be, uh, it would behoove you to talk with a, a contractor that is familiar with all this stuff. Um, Cause you're talking, you know, different things, uh, you know, even simple things like, Will the building owner allow you to do roof penetrations if you want to have a vent stack in or you want to put, you know, a kitchen with a hood in and, you know, what you're going to need for grease trap things and, you know, just, you know, a number of different things. Another uh, another big one is soundproofing, actually. Right. A lot of these places yes. can be quite loud and uh, the louder it is, the worse your beer tastes, actually. <laughs> yeah and the and the the uh shorter people stay that's the yeah. important thing um i actually did a lot of uh, sound attenuation work when i was an engineer at caterpillar uh but that was like the massive diesel engines and uh was uh more just to get them close to residential area for backup power but um what i've noticed you know the 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 architectural trends are hard surfaces you know concrete patterned floors or tile floors um, hard walls, you know, industrial look on the ceiling and that kind of stuff, um, which really looks awesome. Uh, but it turns it into just an echo chamber and, you know, speech and intel- intelligibility goes to crap where, you know, it, and, and it just, you know, the overall sound level raises, people can't hear each other talking. And so they have to talk louder and it gets louder and louder. And, and there's just a lot of people that won't even, they just won't go back. We had, well, we had Randy Mosher on. It's interesting. Uh, the taste actually, your, your sense of taste actually changes when you're in a very loud space and you can't uh, taste subtleties, which is interesting. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, but, uh, bottom line is uh, you do need a lot, build a lot of margin into your plan for a lot of these unexpected things. Because these, these are the things that kind of get you when you when you actually go to open a place and, and also the ones that take all the time. Yeah. Right? You know, and some of them are expensive <laughs> if you didn't plan ahead. Um, like with sound attenuation, a lot of that stuff can be very inexpensive. You know, just, you know, like ceiling mounted uh uh, sound suppression panels that just stop that echoing, you know, or, uh, you know, even, you know, fabric on walls and different things like that. It doesn't have to be super expensive, but if you build the building 
or you know remodel a building and then try to put it in again then it can start getting expensive but you know so you know just things like power access um you know just knowing going in hey i need to get a quote for you know from the power company to uh increase the service to the building uh, and a lot of times, even I found, uh, even for our building, we needed more power. They're happy to sell you more power. Um, so they installed transformers and, and ran power to the building at uh, no cost um, because, you know, we were going to just buy more power. So they were able to amortize that and go, yep, we'll put it in. So don't be afraid to ask uh, that, too. But, you know, just things like, OK, I want to go into a, a, a building that's got a concrete floor with no basement, then I don't have to worry about floor loading and, you know, and, and just general concrete thick, like four inches or whatever they typically will pour in a commercial building is going to be fine uh, for the most part for uh, a nano brewery because they're just, you know, not that heavy. It's not like you're putting yeah. a 60 barrel yeah. brewery uh, fermenter up. Um, well, how do people, uh, how much time does it take to get to get started, what's the typical startup time from you know I want to I want to lease a building to or, or, or even just I would start start planning a, a brewery to actually getting it open. You know I would say ballpark if people are pushing hard and really staying on it and and have a good solid plan. Um, my experience, it's about a year if you're pushing hard to really get it done because you've you've got equipment to get you've got you know to. Um, you know, and that depends. It could be shorter if you know what you're you've found your building and you've got everything all lined up and you've got contractors available. But that's the thing. You know, you've got to have uh, or, or maybe you know, you're lucky and you pick up an existing space. huh? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, you know, so it's going to vary, of course. Uh, but you've got permitting to file and get that going. And sometimes the places they, you know, uh, you're not going to get your actual permits until you provide all the quotes for, you know, all the equipment you're going to put in. And then um, they'll give you the final permit once you uh, have the equipment in place. And, um, you know, there's, you know, you, you know, if you have to do variances or, you know, approvals from, you know, the state or the city or the county for, um, uh, you know, for approval of your plan. Sometimes that can take some time, you know, particularly when, you know, the economy is as strong as it is, um, you know, there's some backlogs. Uh, yeah, hard to get uh, in front of the there. county yeah. board, right? Right. Yeah. And you don't want to start without them because, again, they don't have much of a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, let's finally get around to talking about brewing equipment. Um, yeah. how do you actually go about sizing the brewery? How do you decide what a reasonable size is and, and, and you know, the trade-off between brewing all the time and, and, you know, brewing once a week or something like that? I, I'm going to give a quick answer to that. And then I'm going to go into the longer story, but, yeah. um, doing all the things that we just talked about is it's like, uh, setting up, uh, Oh, this would be good, a good analogy for, for uh, uh for any engineers out there um it's like setting up the integral that's the work is trying to figure out how you're going to put your integral together for your uh for your uh math model after that it's just algebra mm. so I, uh okay so some of the audience may not relate to that but okay i know i just threw that out there just for to add a little geekery but really what what i'm really getting the point i'm getting to is all that stuff that we just talked about that's going to really lead you into um, what size system you need. Uh, you know, that's like, okay, after that, it's, it's a pretty, it, the math is simple to just figure that out. So, you know, to, to kind of recap, do that market study um, and, and, and your business plan and figure out uh, how much beer can I sell? How much beer can I sell in my community? And, you know, some a lot of times if you um, have similar breweries, um, most are pretty cooperative in talking about how much they brew and how many times a week they brew and how much they sell and things like that. Uh, but other communities, you just may not have a brewery, so you may not have that local uh, input. So find a community that's like yours, um, that's near either nearby or, you know, in a similar you know community. It might, it might be like, for example, um, you know, your, your community in Indiana, uh, doesn't have one, but I know that there's one over in Illinois that's next door that, um, uh, has got something similar. Let me see how they do, you know, it might be a little rural community or it might be, a you know, 200,000 population, uh, city. So, um, some of that is just figuring out how much can I sell? Yeah. Uh, because that's, that's going to determine it. 
Um, the other thing that we talked about earlier on uh, figuring out all the different stuff that you're going to be uh, having to do every day that is not necessarily making wort or fermenting wort. Um, how many days does that leave me to brew? So that can limit it too. If you can only brew two days a week or three days a week, or you may have a job and you may be, you know, that, you know, while you're getting this going and you're only going to be able to brew in the evening or, or on weekends, um, you know, factor those things in. Then we talked about employment. Are you going to have somebody help you with uh, the brewing process? We're going to train somebody to come in and brew so that you can be doing other things while they're brewing. There's a, a book I read that uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but one of the things that I took away from it was there's a big difference between working in the business and working on the business. So working in the business is being your own employee and, you know, you know, baking the bread and, you know, mopping the floors. And, and um, in some cases, it's not necessarily a whole lot of fun to, you know, to haul around these 50 pound grain bags. Right? Yeah. It's, not, it's not quite the same as making a five gallon batch. Right. Right. And, and then the other thing is working on the business and that's where you're out uh, doing the marketing work, doing the business work, really studying, you know, learning about the finances and how money moves in the business and, you know, making sure that, you know, you've got, you know, enough cash to keep going. That's the number one thing that, tanks companies is not uh, is not ha not having enough sales, but it's having so many sales that you can't uh, keep up and you get your you outrun your cash headlights. Um, but anyway, that's what I call working on the business. And um, and that was a big takeaway I had, you know, from that uh, uh, that book. And um, those are the kind of things you've that really help you decide um, how big of a brew house to put in. Some other things to factor in that we haven't talked in yet uh, about yet is, um, you know, you're, you know, I talked, I, I talked briefly about your niche and your niche might be, you know, hey, I'm going to have three of our own beers on tap that are going to kind of be our flagship beers. And then I'm going to I'm going to have beers from other, you know, uh, beers from your state that, you know, m you know, that are more like from smaller breweries around. I'm going to have that, that could be your niche or, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just going to have, you know, three flagships and four rotating, uh, beers. Uh, and I'm really going to focus on German lagers, uh, which moving forward there a little bit, lagers are going to take a little bit longer to make. So, uh, you may need a bigger, you may need more celery equipment. Um, well, yeah, or, you, you, uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but I mean, how do you go about picking out the beer lineup and how do you, you know, decide exactly what you want to brew? Uh, you know, some of that is, um, you know, you've learned as a, as a home brewer, what, uh, what the potential market, like meaning friends and things, what they like. And, and remember, it's not what the, that mental transition to a business is, it's not selling the beer you like to brew because you like it and you know a lot of your buddies like it it's selling beer that your customers want to buy um you know if if you just don't like uh you know peanut butter porter i'm just making some weird thing out there but everybody you know because you just like you know i just don't like it but everybody in that uh, the customers come in asking for peanut butter butter porter well you better brew peanut butter porter. Uh, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm thinking IPAs here is the perfect example, but. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, some, some people don't want to brew uh, <laughs> New England IPAs because uh, it's a fad or because they just, you know, don't like them or who knows what, but if your customers are coming in and that's what they want to drink. I mean, if I walk into the average tap room and at least in my area, over half the beers are IPAs now, probably three quarters actually. Oh Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there will say you've got to have your East Coast, you got to have your West Coast, you got to have your Midwestern, you got to have a double and, you the know, you've got to have and you've got to have a session, you know, and they're so, all IPAs. Right. So, you know, that's that um, that's that know your market um, and every place is going to be different. Breweries on the West Coast, you know, customers on the West Coast are going to want different kind of beers than, you know, somebody in uh, uh, Idaho or somebody in Arkansas or somebody in Iowa or, you know, you know, somebody in Ohio or Florida. You know, they're all going to have slightly different tastes. 
whether it be climate, whether it be, you know, um, you know, beers that just, you know, kind of seem popular there. Um, but you can also adapt and flex. Um, you know, there's a lot of tap rooms I've seen that um, they want 12 taps and they will have something. You will never have the same beer twice. You know, you come in the next time that one's gone. We've got uh, some other ones on. So that's going to lead you to brew smaller batches more often. Um, but you're turning different things over. And if that's your niche, it's like, you know, hey, I want to go to that place. It's always got something new and unusual, you know. And, and the nice thing there is you can kind of test market what uh, you know, what works, what doesn't work and, and make different varieties of that. You know, I've seen places that will even do like, a, uh, you know, they'll do a, a kettle sour base and um, in the fermenter, they'll uh, flavor it all sorts of different fruits. I've seen things from, uh, what was it, pop tarts to, uh, you know, all the different berries and uh, all sorts of unusual things. But you can do it with the same base beer and, and turn that into multiple different beers. <clears throat> but so going, a lot of that, going, going back to the equipment, I mean, that the, the selections you make with beer really drive the equipment as well, right? It absolutely does. So once you figure it out how many times a week uh, you can brew uh, and how many styles you want to have on tap at one time and, and how quickly you estimate that you're going to uh, consume those, turn those over, um, you know, then it becomes, oh, OK, well, I need this size brew house uh, because I'm going to brew this many times a week. And uh, I need and, and those beers are going to stay in the fermenter for, uh, you know, 10 days. And they're going to, you know, and they're going to stay in the bright tank for uh, two or three days to uh, clarify and carbonate. Um, and and then the other other thing too to factor in is, are you going to serve out of bright tanks? Or are you going to uh, just have a, you know, one or two bright tanks uh, that you're clarifying and carbonating in and then running into kegs? So um, the bigger your brew house gets, the more you're going to lean towards um, serving uh, at least your flagship beers uh, out of uh, bright tanks and, uh, and less out of kegs. If you're that model where um, – I'm going to have 12 different beers on tap and, you know, I'm just going to brew one or two barrels at a time and, you know, we're just going to keep uh, blowing through them and I'm going to brew, uh, you know, every day, then, you know, it's, it would be easier to just run those into kegs. And a lot of people just forego the uh, bright tank and just run them right into kegs and you know, clarify and find in the keg because they're not moving their kegs around. Interesting. So, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and then obviously you're going to do, you know, more exotic stuff, barrel aged and stuff for sours. They take a tremendous amount of time. Lagers take a, take a lot of time, for example. Right. 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 So, so I mean, uh, what's a, what's a typical setup? Well, you know, you got a, you got obviously a brewing setup and then how many fermenters roughly would you look at selling for a typical setup? Like a typical uh, three and a half barrel uh, brewery would be, uh, you know, four to six fermenters and uh, one or two bright tanks uh, would be a typical one. You know, and 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 that's also um, in general um, getting adding fermentation uh, vessels is the way to expand your capacity. Um, so you you would generally just you know brew more often, or you know, I mean, it'd be great to be able to brew multiple shifts. Um, yeah, I know there's some you, places that brew twice a day, even even some that yes. brew around the clock. Yeah. Right. And double batching, um, you know, versus brewing, you know, double be, uh, batch two, the same two thing batches and, going into one fermenter. Right. Right. Uh huh. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's it's uh, uh, it kind of depends, you know, again, on, you know, what your what your plan is, is, is to how many of those you're going to have. And are you going to run them off into kegs and that kind of thing? Mm. And of course, somebody has to pay for all this. And, uh, you know, a, a, a basic uh, startup would probably easily run into the many tens of thousands of dollars and, and more likely into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, right. Mm -hmm. How do you go about funding that? Uh, there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, uh, get to know your banker well. Yeah. Um, and just and, and that's kind of where you start. And, and that's where your business plan is going to be pretty much required unless you're going to fund this yourself. And, you know, the nice thing about the nano breweries is you're um, 
it's a lot more economical to get into that versus a big production brewery where you're talking, you know, literally millions uh, to do those. Um, and, and the other nice thing is, um, you know, it's, it, it lowers your risk a bit. And, you know, if, if your plan is to get into a, a 20 barrel brew house um, and you start with a smaller one, um, you can really test, uh, test market to make sure, yeah, the demand really is there. Um, and then you've got, you know, your, your startup system can become your pilot system, which is kind of nice, but get to know your banker. Um, they will help you, uh, with developing a business plan. Um, I think the Brewers Association just announced a pre-order for a new book that, geez, I, I swear you turn 55 and you, and you start losing your mind. Um, uh, but a it's new, about new fi- going pro book, I, I assume. It's a book on, um, you know, brewery finance. In fact, that might be the name of it. Uh, but anyway, check out the Brewers Association. But, you know, the, they're gonna, it, that book's going to talk about that kind of stuff. So educate yourself on those things. Talk to a banker. What do I need? Um, there's a lot of uh, communities that will have um, like a, an entrepreneurial programs where you can talk to uh, business people, local business people. It might be, you know, uh, you know, lazy boy recliner you know, business owner, you know, but then, but, you know, putting a business plan together is, you know, very similar. So, you know, you know, those folks can point you in the right uh, path and be good mentors. Even talking to uh, another local brewer uh, is, is helpful. So um, that's really with the, with the financing, get to know uh, the bankers. Sometimes the banks are, they're kind of, you know, they don't know much about brewing, so they may be a little goosey. Um, there's a number of, of banks, uh, national banks, that uh, focus on breweries. Uh, brewery finance is one of them um, uh, that uh, you'll see at Craft Brewers Conference in different places. Um, uh, then, of course, there's the traditional, you know, going out, uh, doing some uh, uh, funding, uh, you know, fundraising, getting uh, partners uh, to come in, bringing on partners. Um, the thing there to be very cautious about is, um, you know, when you have a, a when you bring on a partner, it's no longer just uh, you making uh, the decisions on this, you know, because they're expecting a return on their investment as well. So, um, you know, that's something uh, to consider. Um, and it can be very difficult to extricate yourself from a partnership, right? <laughs> Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Particularly, uh, you if know, the if partners if, start to disagree. Yeah. Or if they're friends or family, you know, yeah. that can be, that can be a problem. So, you know, if you can be the sole guy that's, uh, or gal, that's definitely, uh, makes that a lot easier on that end. Um, you know, but, um, you know, even, you know, these, if, if you can reach out to one of these, uh, you know, entrepreneur workshop, uh, type places, uh, they can help you with that as well, you know, but be very careful when you bring on partners or when you're uh, taking, you know, money from others, because that's really is a commitment and a promise uh, to give them a, a return. And, you know, that's, you know, it's important to do the right thing there, but it's also can be uh, risky on, on your end as well. Yeah, I know even with, uh, you know, have like angel funding where, you know, people come in and fund your business. Uh, they're usually looking to get that money out in a fairly short amount of time, usually within a few right. years. So. So, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult in some cases to hang on. Yeah. Um, and, and I say if, if, if the bank isn't willing to lend you money, you really need to look at your business plan and, and, and be honest with yourself as to why aren't they willing to lend me money? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, is it because your costs are too high? Is it because your, your sales projections just don't seem realistic? Um, you know, is it, you know, you know, some of it, you know, can be as simple as, uh, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to lease a, a building for that kind of cost, or you haven't included renovation costs, or you haven't, um, you know, included, you know, all the different taxes. Um, so, th- and we talk know, about having a big margin too. <laughs> right, very important. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's you know, or cash flows. You know, yeah, it shows you're making a profit, but guess what? You're you're spending more than you're making. Um, so, um, that's kind of one of the other real things to look at, you know, you know, just one of the big things is be honest with yourself and, um, you know, listen to the bank If the bank won't lend you money. There's a reason, you know, cause they make money by lending money. They don't make money by lending 
money to somebody they don't think is going to pay them back. Um, so just take that to heart. Don't take it personally and, and just find out, you know, why that is and fix it. Um, you know, and, and one of the other things, even, even with, uh, your beer, um, and I'm sure most people have heard this already. Uh, you know, when you're test, when you're doing your test batches, don't ask your buddies what they think of it. Um, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, you need to ask, uh, complete strangers. You need to ask people that aren't beer, you know, connoisseurs, uh, what they think of it, because a large, large portion of your customer base is going to be, uh, people who casual drinkers, right? Yeah. Casual drinkers. And they've got to like what you're, what you're making. And again, if it's a triple IPA, that's, you know, quadruple hopped, you know, and that's just, you know, you just think it's amazing. And, you know, the beer judges are like, dang, this is just great. Uh, you know, but, you know, a guy and his wife come in and, and, you know, and, and take one sip and go, oh my gosh, I can't drink that. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to make you money. So, you know, I, I, I say when you're doing this test marketing and, and you've got some of your beers to sample, get people you don't know. Send, uh, send them right to John, right? Yeah. Yeah. He'll sample yeah. them for you. You know, or, or if they're judges, that will truly give you an honest an, an honest, uh, you know, assertion of what they think of your beers and then don't take it personally and be honest because they're really doing you a favor. If you go to market with a uh, beer that isn't hitting the mark, uh, you could lose all of what you've put into that business and you don't want that to happen. So the people that are doing you the favors are the ones that are being honest with you. The ones that are telling you what you want to hear are the ones that, uh, could, be an accomplice in you starting a business. That's I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, uh, I think you were there for the story. Uh, uh, I think was it Sierra Nevada. They threw out like the first day, the guy threw out the first eight batches or something. Cause yeah. it wasn't up to a standard, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and great personal expense. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, this was like a five barrel system or something, you know, which was huge back then, you know, you know, but you know, so he was, you know, he went from a home brewer to, you know, a commercial brewer. So it was, you know, like a thousand bucks a batch or something. I don't know what it was, Yeah. Uh, you know, but it was, you know, that was a ton of cash. We're, talk, we're talking know. about an example where uh, uh, this is one of the early startups, but they, uh, they actually started the brewery and uh, the brewer or the brewer slash owner threw out, I think it was the first seven or eight batches because they weren't up to his standards and he right. wasn't going to serve them. So, I mean, that's a good example of, of you know, going yeah. that extra mile for the customer, I guess. And they did halfway decent, it seems. Yeah. This yeah. is... <laughs> Um, well, uh, the, the last question I want to ask you is how do you manage growth? So let's say you go through all this, you know, go through the gauntlet here, you get the brewery open and, uh, you start selling beer and it's selling like hotcakes. What do you do now? How do you well, uh, step up to the next level? Well, I'm going to give you a great piece of advice that I learned from my boss's boss's boss. I don't know how many boss's bosses it was who had his hands around my throat. And after saying, God, damn, why do all engineers think alike? And I somehow managed to say, not say, because we're always right. <laughs> but uh, then he said, the runway behind you doesn't do you any good. And that is something that totally stuck with me uh, from this guy. It was actually a great boss. I just drove him crazy, I think. Uh, but what I mean there is you've got a plan for growth. And you've also got a plan for not growth. Um, so, you know, Plan for what you think you need, um, you know, with with and and also, you know, have a little bit of forethought, but don't, you know, if if you think, yeah, I can start with a three barrel uh, brew house. Don't start with a, a 10 thinking eventually you'll grow in it because you may never be able to fund all of that uh, equipment uh, to get you to that point, you know, so. Uh, you know, some of that is, is, is really what is my startup plan? And then what's my growth plan? Leave room in the building because the fastest way to grow is to just add fermentation space and brew more often. You can brew 24 seven, you know, you can hire people to do that. So the brew house is generally not going to be your limiter. It's going to be your, your seller space. Of course, it gets to a point where, okay, can I justify having, you know, hiring, you know, three people to brew, you know, all day long and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, of course there's a limit to that, but, you know, leave yourself space for growth. And the neat thing about adding uh, selling equipment is um, I can get that in fairly short order and double the amount of beer I can brew. 
Um, so, you know, that's really the thing is plan. Do I have enough space? Do I have enough, um, you know, uh, glycol chiller capacity? Can I add glycol chiller capacity? Um, you know, what, what's my plan for hiring people? Um, and we, we also talk about this other challenge where let's say you're really successful in the tap room. Now you got this kind of ugly choice. You either got to grow into, um, you know, turn yourself into a production brewery or you have to open another tap room somewhere. Right. 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 So I mean, there's just, you know, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the other things too, is making sure that you've got a reasonable size building. Um, you know, I won't say buy all you can afford, uh, that that's the the voice of of, of realtors, um, but um, I've never been disappointed with getting a little bit more than what I think I need, yeah. um, and you know so it's you know just having that space where you can grow. Um, try to you know some of that is you know particularly with your retail space. Um, that's what that's what the customers are are going to be experiencing and. Um, if you can, you know, make that a nice place with some possibility to grow, like you might move into a building that's got another unit next to it that you could expand into, um, you know, that'd be something uh, that would be nice to be able to do. I know there's uh, that brewery I was talking about earlier um, uh, that uh, uh, does the uh, delivery of different uh, restaurants around. Um, they actually expanded into the unit next to them. And um, uh, we're able to have they're planning to do some more uh, cooking and things. So I have a little, uh, you know, a, a restaurant there. So um, so that's that's really that planning set, putting that runway ahead of you. Um, that is going to help. You don't need to use all the runway, uh, but, you, you know, and that runway is the planning, but you need to be ready for it. Great. Well, John, unfortunately, we're coming out of running out of time here. I think we could talk for another hour easily about this, but um, I think so. <clears throat> really appreciate you coming on the show, uh, John. Thank you. Well, it's always glad, and I thank you for the opportunity, uh, uh, Brad, uh, to just be able to give back to an industry and and folks that uh, have helped me out uh, so much. So it's just uh, an honor to give back to everybody, and I really appreciate it. So. And my guest today was uh, Mr. John Blickman, president of Blickman Engineering, producers of both home brewing and uh, large, large uh, commercial brewing equipment now. That's so. right. Oh, and, and for people that really want to learn a lot more about um, uh, this, there is a uh, NanoCon in, uh, happened in the, I think it's the 31st through the 4th, I believe, uh, don't, don't, of, uh, of October. This is uh, sponsored by Brew Your Own Magazine, I believe, so right. you can probably yeah, pull that NanoCon. up. Yeah, and it's going to be in uh, Vancouver, Washington, a uh, beautiful area. Um, and uh, you'll be able to rub elbows with some great experts in that industry. Um, uh, I'll be there giving a, a presentation uh, on uh, sizing your brewery. And uh, there's just so many more um, uh, people that are there to help. You can talk to a, uh, just the other attendees. Just a great way to learn uh, uh, about this uh, as you're starting to think about going pro. So have a look for your own NanoCon. Well, thank you again, John. Appreciate you being on the show. Absolutely. A big thank you to John Blickman for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith and get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also Blickman Engineering with the new Brew Commander. The Brew Commander is a new brew house controller available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is an innovative, high-quality brew house controller with ultra-high precision and the ultimate in flexibility. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. Order yours today. Visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And Beersmith 3 is available now for download on both desktop and mobile platforms. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider support, new Whirlpool hop options, support for high-altitude brewing, and a whole lot more. Check out Beersmith 3 and get your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.